This is our first of two videos where we're going to look at an application of integration to a concept that's very important in uh, engineering and physics, and it's the idea of center of mass. So in particular, center of mass has been an important impact in your design of anything that moves uh, for purposes of stability. So whether it's a vehicle on the ground, particularly if you have a vehicle flying through air, or if you have something moving in space, the center of mass is extremely important to be able to not only maintain a stable path or trajectory, but also to uh, ensure that you have the right amount of propulsion and the right amount of uh, design in order to have a safe and long-lasting vehicle. So the first idea is the idea of a moment. A moment in physics or engineering measures the tendency of a force to cause an object to rotate. So it is uh, related to the notion of torque, if you're familiar with that. So for one dimensional problems, the rotation is going to be about a specific point. And for two dimensional problems, the rotation is about a specified line or an action. And so the moment induced by a force F about point P is just going to be the uh, length of the force times the distance. And here I didn't put it in, but the force is assumed to be acting perpendicular to this line segment represented by D. So for example, you think about a line segment that could be horizontal and the forces are being applied uh, vertically. So I have two forces that are going down and we're thinking of that as being weights, right? So I have a weight here that has units five and 10 and I don't have any units here. Pick the units that you like. If you like kilograms and meters, just imagine the distances are in meters and the or newtons because they're weights. You can use newtons. Or we could have them as pounds and the distances could be feet. But we just have some units of length, some units of weight here. And then uh, the arrow says that this force F is pushing up because as we're going to see, we want to look at the case where no rotation is induced at all uh, on this particular line segment, uh, in which case uh, I want the line segment to be not moving. In order for it to not move, the forces have to add up to zero. So if I consider the forces going down as negative and the forces going up as positive, the upward forces have to equal the downward forces. All right, so got a little distracted there because all we're going to do here is review the idea of moment. Moment of uh, W1 about certain point and the moment about W2. Well, we do want to introduce a, a sign convention here. And the sign convention is that if your moment would cause the line segment to rotate counterclockwise, we're going to call that positive moment. If it causes a rotation in the clockwise direction, we're going to say that is a negative moment. In the end, we're going to see that uh, we don't have to have that uh, convention memorized. If I were to put everything on a line, on a 
on a number line. But for now, let's just use this convention. So the moment of W1 about point P. So the distance from W1 acts at B. So the distance from P to B is 2. And you can see that it would be pushing uh, the line segment down, causing a clockwise rotation. And so that's going to give me a negative moment. So if 10 is the size of the force, negative because of our convention, and then 2 is the distance, so negative 10. Now, if I rotate or push or look at the moment about point A, now my moment arm, that's that distance, it's called the moment arm, is much larger. It's 5. It would still cause a rotation in the clockwise direction, so it's still negative. But now I get a much larger moment, negative 50. Now if I look at point C, the moment about point C, well, so imagine fixing point C. Now this force, W1, is would cause the line segment to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. And so it'll be a positive moment. And I take my weight 10 by the distance 1 to get 10. All right, let's just do this once again with W2. Now W2 is over on the other side of this line segment. It only is has a value of 5. About point P, it would cause a rotation which would be counterclockwise, so it's positive. So 5 times that moment arm, 3. 5 times 3 gives me 15. Now at point A, the, the force is being applied at point A, so it doesn't cause any rotation at all. And the distance there then would be 0, and so no moment generated at all. And then at point C, now I have a really long moment arm. The distance from A to C is 6. And if C is my fixed point, then I would be rotating in the counterclockwise direction. So that's positive again. So now, if the forces represent weight, then the center of mass is the point where the sum of all the moments is zero, when the system is in equilibrium. And for us, equilibrium means the nothing is moving. All the forces are equal, and it's, a, it's not rotating, it's not translating, it's just stationary. All of the forces are balanced, all of the moments are balanced. So the center of mass is that balancing point. So if I have three weights hanging off this line segment, my center of mass would be the point where if I were to hang this with a string, put a string right here at my center of mass and hang it, this line segment would be balanced. It would not rotate, it would not move at all, it would be in equilibrium. So here, rather than putting a string, I actually said I can balance this right here uh, on this force F at the center of mass. Now it's not moving, so the force F has to be pushing up with the same value as the sum of the other forces, the weights that are pushing down. So now I'm going to call this distance from A out to the center of mass as my x bar. And I'm going to then calculate the moments and say, well, those moments have to be add up to 0. So 
calculating about the moment, about the point A, the moment of the first weight, weight one, is just zero because weight one is applied at point A. Weight two has a moment arm of three, and it would cause the line segment to rotate in a clockwise direction, so it'll be a negative nine times three. Weight three would also cause a clockwise rotation. Its moment arm, though, is nine, so I'm gonna have negative 18 times nine there. And we're not working these out on purpose. We're going to see in a minute. And then our force that's pushing up to keep the system in equilibrium, its moment arm is unknown. That's what we're looking for. That's the x bar. And it's pushing up with a force of 39 and would cause a clockwise rotation. So it would be positive. So this clockwise rotation has to counteract all of these, I'm sorry, this counterclockwise rotation has to counteract all of these clockwise rotations. So the sum of moments is going to have to be zero. All right. So now I can solve that for x bar, and I can see that I forgot to put a bar over that x here. All right. And look at how we can rewrite x bar. If I don't multiply these out, I would get 12 times 0 plus 9 times 3 plus 18 times 9 over 12 plus 9 plus 18. The 12, 9, and 18 appear in the top and the bottom. So this is a weighted average where the weights are literally the weights. And uh, the sum of the moments then, I'm sorry, the weights are not literally the weights. If I'm talking about a weighted average, the, the weights are actually the lengths of the moment arm. But this x bar can be found by just taking the sum of the moments of the original weights, right? This f calculation is not really needed uh, because it comes into this total mass calculation in the denominator. I want to find the center of mass of a one-dimensional system, all I need to do is pick the a fixed point, calculate the moments about those fixed points, and divide that by the total mass of the system. So what we're going to do in order to simplify things is we're going to pick, um, we're going to put our system on a number line and then we're going to take moments about the origin, about the uh, zero location on the number line. So let's put everything on a, a number line. If I do that, then I don't have to be concerned about thinking about if the moment is positive or negative, because that will come out e immediately from the uh, point on the number line. So if I have a negative value, that will take care of what sign I need to have on the uh, moment there. And so uh, I guess it flies in the face of our original uh, convention because uh, the way this is going to work is if my forces are going down, and they have a negative and they're applied at a negative value uh, that will wind up being a negative number but it was just a convention and so this is going to be much easier to work with than to think about the type of rotation that is being induced we just let the sign on this number line 
determine whether we have a positive or negative moment. So my x bar would be the moment about zero. So this again makes it very simple. I just look at where is it applied? Negative two. So the moment for this force would be 10 times negative two. The moment for this force would be 10 times four. And the moment for this force would be 30 times eight. So I'd add up all of those moments, divide by the sum of those masses or weights, and find out that C should have been at five exactly. What if I have a two-dimensional case? I still have point weights, but now they're being applied at, at a grid. So uh, this is a two-dimensional, but you can imagine that the, the, the weights are actually pushing the grid into the screen. So the, the weights are being applied at these points, and they're all trying to push the grid into the screen. So the center of mass um, would need to balance out two types of moments. So a given force, if we fix the y-axis, a given force will try to make the grid rotate about that y-axis. So we have some moments about the y-axis. Or if we had fixed the x-axis, a given force would induce a rotation, or cause the grid to rotate about the y-axis. And so we have some moments, I mean, about the x-axis. So we have some moments about the x-axis as well. So let's think about this. So uh, the weight is going to induce a moment about the x-axis and about the y-axis. The center of mass is going to have two coordinates then, an, an x-bar and a y-bar. And at that point, the system is going to be balanced. So again, if I imagine you took this grid and you hung your weights from it, so this, is, this grid represents the x-y plane, if I were to tie a string at the center of mass and hang it from the ceiling, then this grid would be perfectly balanced. It would not rotate at all. It would remain uh, parallel to the plane of the ceiling and the plane of the floor, and it would not rotate in or move in any way. So that's our idea of the center of mass in 2D. It's still a balancing point, but now we're balancing this grid. So to calculate the moments about the x-axis, well, you would take your weight and then multiply that by the length of the moment arm. That's the distance to, the shortest distance to the x-axis. Well, that would be the y-coordinate of that point. So for Wn, the distance to the x-axis is 2, which is my y-coordinate there. At W2, the distance to the x-axis is 4. Again, that's its y-coordinate, the y-coordinate of the point where W2 is applied. And so on for all of the weights in the system. Again, the distance where to the x-axis from where the weight is applied is just the y-coordinate of that point. And so my y-coordinate of the center of the mass can be found by summing up all of those moments and dividing by the total mass or total weight. And so this uh, m sub x means the moment of the entire system about the x-axis, not just a single weight, but m sub x without any kind of other notation indicates the moment of x of the entire system, or moment about the x-axis. 
So I'm going to go ahead and calculate that. That's just going to be the weight times the corresponding y coordinate of the point divided by the total weight, and that gives me one half. Now I'll do something similar for the x bar. The my is the moment of the entire system about the y-axis, and so I have to calculate the sum of the moments of each of the weights, and the weights uh, are a distance of x sub i from the y-axis, where x sub i is the corresponding x-coordinate of the point where the weight gets applied. And so in our example, I can calculate uh, those weights. I can see that uh, for 4 and 3, weights 3 and 4, I actually have negative y coordinates. So that just uh, is taken care of just like I had some negative x coordinates and when I was calculating y bar. That's fine. That's what we need in order to keep it balanced. And so I get negative 3 sixteenths. So there's actually a little symbol that's rep used to represent the center of mass. Uh, this one is not drawn very well, but the way it, it looks like is you have a circle, which is divided up into four uh, sectors, and uh, two of them are colored in and two of them are left blank. So that indicates center of mass. So uh, many times when you see large equipment being installed in a data center or a factory floor, they may have a little sticker or some other way of indicating where the center of mass is because knowing where the center of mass is is very important if you have to move the equipment or you want to make sure, for example, that it would be safe in an earthquake. All right, so let's talk about lamina. So a lamina is actually a 3D object, but it's really very thin. So you know, we're really focused on the uh, top face or the bottom face, so the base or the top of this, because we're going to say it's very thin. It has a constant thickness. And in this class, we're going to consider it to have a constant density as well. If you go on into Calc 3 or maybe some other classes, uh, you, you can see what happens when the density is not constant. But here we're going to have a constant thickness and a constant density. So the weight of this lamina is actually proportional to the area of its base or the area of the top. And why is that? Well, because weight is volume times density. And we said density is a constant. The volume of this lamina, it's really just a very thin prism. And so it'd be the area of the base times the thickness. So the thickness is a constant. The density is constant. So the product of the thickness times the density gives us our constant of proportionality. So if we're concerned about the weight, we can just look at the area of the base of the lamina. Now, if a lamina has a line of symmetry, uh, and we have these cases where the thickness is constant and the density is constant, then it makes sense that wherever the center of mass is, I have to balance this particular uh, rectangle, for example. But whatever shape I have, if it has a line of symmetry, then the center of mass has to be somewhere on that line of symmetry. So, so for a rectangle, which has two lines of symmetry, uh, the center is going to be right in the center. So if we're asked to calculate the center of mass of a rectangular lamina, uh, we just need to find out what the coordinates are of the center of that rectangle. That's the center of mass. So suppose I have a lamina which is composed of rectangles. So I have this F-shaped 
lamina. Well, what you can do is you can treat this as a system of rectangles and replace the rectangle by a point weight. And that point weight has to be applied at the center of mass of the corresponding rectangle and be given the same weight as the weight of the entire rectangle. So this, I'd like to find the center of mass then of this lamina using this technique of breaking it down into smaller rectangles. So I've made three rectangles here, a yellow one, a green one, a blue one, that's R1, R2, and R3. There's other ways I could have broken this down into rectangles. I just chose this way. It may not be the best way, but it's going to work for our lesson or our example. So I'm going to make a little table. I've got three rectangles. I'm going to calculate the area because remember the weight is going to be proportional to the area. And we're going to replace then that rectangle with a point mass which is acting at its center of mass and whose weight is the area. So the area of the uh, first rectangle, the red rectangle, that's the yellow rectangle, R1, it's two units by five units, that's its area. And the center of mass is the center of the rectangle, which is, well, the y coordinate is at four and the x coordinate is at three and a half. And I can do the same with the green rectangle and the blue, which is actually a square, the blue square, I can find its area and the coordinates of its center of mass. So, the total mass is going to be some constant of proportionality times the sum of the areas. Which if I add those together, I get 19 times that constant. The moments are going to be that same constant. The moment about the x-axis, I'm just going to have to take the area times the y corresponding y-coordinate of the center of mass for each rectangle. For the, oh, let's work that out. So I get 49.5 times that constant K. So this K is the same in the moment calculation and in the mass calculation. The moment about the Y axis, what would I do? I'd take the area times its corresponding X coordinate, meaning the X coordinate of the center of mass of that rectangle, add those up, and multiply by this constant of proportionality. And that works out to be 54.5 times k. So really this k value uh, is not relevant to our final calculation because we're going to see that they're going to divide out. I have a k in the moment, I have a k in the total mass, k over k is 1, and so it really doesn't make sense for us to even include the K in our calculations there. We could just use um, or assume the K is one when we're calculating the coordinates of the center of mass. And so now I get uh, my center of mass to have coordinates 109 over 38 and 98 over 38. Well, if I forget about the uh, k value and just focus on the region, then really we're, instead of the center of mass, what we're looking at is something called the centroid. The centroid is location of the center of mass of the lamina that has constant density and whose top face is that region. 
So going back to our previous calculations here, calculating the centroid of this F-shaped region would mean that I would just take K to be equal to 1. I'd use the same formulas. So centroid just frees us of having to think of that constant of proportionality. It is a geometric property of the region. So it's very much connected to the center of mass under these specific conditions. But you can talk about the centroid of a region in the plane without it actually representing a, any physical object. So now, if I have a region which consists of n rectangles, we saw that we could calculate the uh, center of mass, or now the centroid, uh, by using this formula. The denominator was the total area, the area of all of the rectangles. And then we took a, uh, the moment was just the area times the uh, corresponding x-coordinate of the center of mass, and in this case, the centroid of the rectangle. Now, even though this doesn't have to represent physically a moment, we're still going to call this m sub y, moment about the y-axis, and we'll still call this m sub x, just to make our notation simpler. So I'm going to stop here. Now that we've got the idea of uh, centroids, we have an idea of the center of mass. And in particular, we know that for a rectangle, the center of mass is the center of the rectangle, or the centroid of the uh, rectangle is the center of the rectangle. And if I have a region that can be broken up into rectangles, we can just look at the centroid of each rectangle and um, the area of each rectangle to be able to calculate the centroid of the system. And that's going to help us do some calculus in the next video.